Okay, we're recording. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started then. I kind of will be going back and forth. Again, I'm Andrea, sorry to introduce myself. Um, I'll be going through, um, kind of going back and forth through my slide and then my test account, just kind of to show where this kind of stuff is. Um, so the first thing we'll be going through this morning, um, again, is what I um, said would be the checklist. So the checklist, uh, the first part of it, um, what you want to make sure is the district. Um, again, every district probably has a, uh, their checklist um, according to how they like it. Um, so we just have a sample one out there um, and they can find that under our appendix. If they want to go ahead and use that, they can do that. And then um, if they don't, um, again, they can it to how they want to process their payroll. So the first thing um, on the payroll check is ODGFS new hire before they get started. Um, they just want to make sure they process that. Um, so they want to make sure that their position, payroll items, pay distribution, payroll accounts, and employer data is added. Um, again, on they should create the ODGF new hire report before each payroll because that has to be submitted within 20 days of a new employee. So again, this would be under the reports and then on, over the ODGF new hire. And again, you can see the employees with their new hire date and under the employee screen that will show the employee, um, the new hire date of when they started. So again, they can select, makes it a little easier for the districts to select these employees um, that are should be um, recorded. And again, they can double click or they can just use the arrow. So when they can go ahead and then they can generate the file, they can review that before they create the submission file. And then what they need to do is go to um, upload that file to the ODGF website. Um, for the header, um, the OGF new hire um, optional header, um, what this is allows the districts to add a validation only. And that is down here. If they include the headers for the validation in the submission file, they have that option to include that. Let's see. And sorry, this print is so small. So if they want that header line to be added in the submission file, they can add that um, through the validation. Um, again, the validation step, is this is an optional step, but if they're going to use it, um, then the headers are required on the file and they can check the box, um, that box on there, and that will include those um, headers when generating the file. So again, that's just for the validation, but when they're actually submitting the file, to um, ODGF new hire, then that box should be unchecked. The next one is the SERS new hire report, um, reporting the new SERS employee. So they want to make sure that they get these employees um, every before every payroll, um, any new employees, they want to select that. So again, you would go to your reports and your new hire. And then any employee that has the box to report to new hire, um, the criteria would be um, for them to show on that new hire report would be on the 400 payroll item. They have to have that set up and with the new employee box checked as new employee. And then they have to hold that position um, that has a service as retirement code and then the position start date um, both found on the position screen, and that must be within the 180 days of that current day in order for it to be included on that report. So those are the criteria. And then what this, uh, the new hire report um, actually will look at all the positions for the employee that are SERS, and then it will use the earliest position start date within that six months to be included on that report. So again, then all they would do then once they do have employees on here, they generate the report and generate the file, then they would have to go to their ESERS 
and um, upload that new hire submission file. For the search new hire, again, that would be underneath your reports, under new hire. So again, for the criteria for that, it's pretty much the same as SERS. Um, the employee has to have a four, um, 450 pair item set up with the new employee box checked. And then the position start date, um, that which would be um, found on the position screen, must be within the 180 days in order for it to be included on that SERS new hire report. So again, you can go ahead and click the generate re-report, verify it. You can generate the submission file at that time or what if they um, know the report is correct and if they just wanna generate the submission file and, and submit it to SIRS automatically, they have that option right here. So that will upload it automatically right to SIRS. Um, if they create the file generation, um, generate submission file, um, they can upload that at a different time and then they can go back and choose the file from their desktop or wherever they saved it and upload that and then they can submit upload file to STIRS. So either way, they can do it um, on the first option here, or they can do it at a later time and choose the file from their desktop if that's where they saved it, and then go ahead and submit it to um, STIRS. The next one is um, the posting period, again, you wanna make sure that they have the correct posting period open for the payroll they're wishing to process so they're not in the wrong month. Um, the payroll that you're processing cannot be posted until the payroll period is set to current. So again, they wanna make sure that their posting period is open. And before they actually post it to USAF, they wanna make sure um, that they have it set to current. Right here. Okay. And the next one, um, to get a payroll number to compare, um, some districts like to run their future, the future report first, um, so they can, or run a payroll, excuse me, as a test payroll, just to get started to make sure that they're all, all their numbers are looking okay and then make sure they don't have anything in future. So they can go ahead and do a test payroll um, actually go into payroll processing, run a payroll, um, what they're going to, what their payroll is going to start as, and just go ahead and verify that they're starting from, um, that there's nothing in there. Um, I don't know how many districts do this, but it is a suggestion if they want to do that. So once they do run that test payroll, then they can go ahead and just um, click on um, delete payroll, and that will delete everything that they just created. So again, this is just something the districts can do. They don't have to. Um, they just make sure that no data is entered in future. So just a suggestion. Um, again, at that time then, the districts can start entering their absence and attendance at that time. Um, they can go to the core attendance. So they can create them here singly by one at a time for each employee, or they can actually do a mass add. So again, the districts have the option to do it, um, create uh, for individually employee, or they can do a mass add if they have um, maybe subs that are um, working um, multiple days, they can create that all at once in a mass add, save them some time. So the mass add would be here. And again, you would just check the employee and what position, again, if there are absence, they can do that here too, or attendance. And then they can enter a date of when they were absent and create. And gotta make sure the employee has sick leave, but just an example. And then they can save that and it'll automatically be set to attendance. So it's just a little time saver on that. And again, they can also do um, utilize the um, absence import. I do have a spreadsheet here that I created. And here is an example of that import. 
Um, they would just have to make sure that they have all their figures or entry data in for what they want that um, employee. And a lot of, you know, maybe they have a third party software that they use for um, their attendance and absence so that they can use that and create a spreadsheet and import it in. So I was going to import that in using over here. So they go to utilities import. They can go ahead and choose the file. And again, they have that option. They can location by code. They can do that by the IRN department code, or they want to post it directly to future or current. Now, if they do the current, they have to make sure the payroll is started. Um, I don't have one started yet, so I'll just do the future. Um, again, you can combine the attendance entries at this time. So that way, um, if there's 0.5 for quite a few um, for the same day or something for an employee, they can combine those attendance entries. Um, allow negative lead balances. They can have that option set up right at this point if they need to. So that way it allows the spreadsheet to go through without um, airing out. So if I import that, and if it don't work, I will get an at error CSV. And this should tell you all the errors that the employee, um, that the district gets for any of the employees. But I have my records loaded without any issues. And then it tells you also how many total future pay amounts were loaded. So if I go to attendance, you're going to see my record was loaded. Let's see who my employee is here. And one, oh, one, two, three. Oh. And then there's my record or position four. And then if I also go to future, we'll be able to see that also. Okay. okay. Um, so the next thing they can do after they get that done, we have an attendance journal out there under um, SSDT. So they can run this report and see all the attendance that they added in. So they would enter a start date or end date, again, they of their payroll beginning and ending, and then they can also run it if they want to see only active and active employees, they can type that in, or if they leave it blank, then they'll see all of them, again, for the appointment type or the type of attendance or absence. I'm just going to leave them blank because I want to generate the whole report for everybody. And then here's the report. So they can run this after they get all their attendance in, and then that way they can go through and if they have a checklist for each um, on that spreadsheet, they can go through and check each one to make sure they actually have that entered in for every employee and they didn't miss one. So this could be very helpful for districts when they're just double checking everything for their payroll. The next one would be, oh, maybe, can't get it to go down. There we go. The next one would be your future. Um, so now you can go ahead if um, you have timesheets. If you don't, if they don't use utilize the attendance and post directly, then they can use they can go into future and then do the other part of it for the time slips. So then they, they would just go to their future and enter their time slips in here uh, for the pay. Um, again, they can utilize the um, attendance absent import like I did previously. And then again, once they enter in all their future pay and they got everybody entered that they need, they can go to home. And then again, we have a report out here, which I think it should be located under payroll. Um, so they can just, um, well, I guess they can because it's future entry. So once you do that, that, that does make sense. That won't work won't that will clear those out. Um, what you would do is enter in your payroll effective dates. Um, again, I guess I should back up. The effective dates would be only if um, they're entering um, future entries that are going to be effective for the future. So if they don't have a effective payroll date for or that's going to be included of that beginning and ending, um, if they don't utilize that during future, um, effective date, then just leave those blank. 
and it will pull in everybody. Now, um, the pay groups, again, they can run this according to what pay group. If they do, just make sure they're um, added in pay group by commas so they can do multiple. So if they go ahead and generate the report, should I should have two entries. Yeah, so here's my two entries that I have in future. So you wanna make sure that those all their future entries, so here they can double check. And then they can, if they have a running total, what their future should be before they start payroll, then right here um, would be their total, grand total. And again, they can make sure that their specific pay accounts are correct. If they did enter them by specific or here it's just gonna uh, use their normal pay, pay account for Hearst. So only if they enter a specific pay account would it be under here. So that could be very helpful too, to make sure their totals are correct before they even start the payroll. So now we're gonna go ahead and initialize the payroll. And my dates are kind of old because my test account goes back from to 2021. They haven't quite been updated yet. So I'm gonna enter my dates. This is my second payroll. And then And again, here, the district has options. Um, if they need to maybe run a special pay um, suppressed voluntary deductions, this would be that option here. They can check that and no voluntary deductions would come out of that employee's payroll. Um, ignore direct deposit. Maybe they need to run um, something was missed and they have to run it as check. Um, they can do this and this would ignore all the direct deposit flags on the employee screen and it will create checks for all employees. And then if they need to run a special pay, they can do that here too. So you have to select everybody and bring them over. Now, if they need to do additions at this time, maybe you have districts that have a lag time of time slips coming in. This is very helpful because um, like with SIRS, um, they get kind of picky on when um, their time slips are being um, being sent to SERS and then the dates. So we know that we suggest districts that have this lag, maybe two weeks prior effect of their beginning ending dates, they have, they're on a different pace time, but doing the same pay date. So this is where they can add those pay groups in here and add a different, different start and stop date. So then when they do um, get included, when they run SERS, they can actually have their um, regular payroll. And then they also can include this other um, date and they actually will get included on the SERS file with the correct hours and days that they worked. So they don't get missed because sometimes they're not getting picked up on that SERS report. And districts are asking why they're not getting picked up. It's because they're on such a lag from the pay start and stop date. When they're adding, when they're entering those attendance days in. So again, this is very helpful for districts to stay on track and they're not forgetting any employees and they don't have to go in and do a lot of uh, um, adjustments for SERS days or uh, SERS hours um, for these employees to get picked up on that file. So I will go ahead and utilize, oh, what does it say? Oh, my date. I'm in the wrong date, sir. Let me try this in. Let's see if this works. There we go. Okay. So we're utilize or initialize the payroll. And again, if you have any issues, you're going to see red dot status over here. Your date range. Again, this would be, and I have your one I have. So let's we'll see what that is. Oh, this is just an employee that I had added that Brent Hurst. So for the number four. So they, again, your error report should show you everything that um, 
if your warnings and then your errors again, they cannot go any further until they get the errors corrected. So like this one, not enough accounts to distribute. So they have to go, go in and go to their pay distributions and make sure they get that corrected. And then their charge um, to distribute over pay accounts for the employee. So they wanna make sure they get that um, corrected too. So I can't really go any further until I get those corrected. So let's do that quick. Hearst, so there's my Hearst. Looks fine. So let's see, what else? Oh, my account. That's my payroll account. Let's do that. And it's number four. And I thought I had that all done, but let's see. Another account's position. Oh, I have a lot of stop dates. That's why. Okay. So let's just take those out. I don't know how my stop dates all got in there. Um, I think we're good now. Okay, so let's try that again. So we can move on from there. Okay, there we go, now we're corrected. So we got our payroll started. So now again, like I said, I did my error report. You have to clean those up first. Then you can run your payroll report. Again, you can um, begin each employee on a new page, include employer payroll items amounts. I always like to include that so I can see that. And then you can also run just a report total also at this time. So then you have your payroll report. And then you can go ahead and verify to make sure all your amounts are correct. You can look at your pay group totals. You can look at report summary and verify that those all look correct and they make sure they have everything entered. And then the next thing you wanna do, you can run your pay item detail report. I'm not gonna run through each one because I won't have enough time to, if I run each one. Um, so we'll just go through the reports here. Um, process a pay item detail report. You can run that in projection. So you wanna verify the withholding amount to make sure that's accurate. Also verify the totals for retirement and Medicare. Then they can run the pay item summary report. And all this is is a summary of the payroll item totals. The budget distribution report is to verify the budget report. The process that paid distribution report, this is verifies the um, account totals appear in the accurate and the total amount on the report matches the total gross from your payroll report. Um, at this time, um, some districts maybe need to start over in their payroll. They selected the wrong or they entered the wrong dates or something. Um, they can do that at this time. Um, they have two options. They can do to delete payroll. This will de delete the whole payroll. Um, but if they enter exceptions in, like through current, um, it will move those to future so it's not lost. So again, this only pertains to the entries that were added in employees that, um, this will only pertain to entries added to employees that already exist in payroll. So anybody that probably was added in current, those won't be saved. So if they did those additions and they added somebody new into current, then those will not be saved to future. So it's just the people that um, already were in current, and then those will save over to future. Now, if they do the de delete payroll and exceptions, you want to make sure you do um, that will delete the payroll and any exceptions that were in their in payment in payroll payment. So again, they can utilize this if they need to, but they just want to be careful on which ones they select. Um, then they can go ahead and process the pay, pay amount summary report so they can verify the regular accrued, um, make sure the miscellaneous overtime, your doc retro and irregular amounts are all correct. So they want to make sure that they um, total all the pay totals and these should match their total gross um, from the pay report. 
So that pay amount summary, they can verify the pay report and the pay amount summary together. Um, the deferred docked amount um, on the pay amount summary report, that will not be included in the total pay column, but it will be included, included on the other pay column. So if I go ahead and run this, I think this is the report. Oh, wrong one. Let's try this again. Amount summary report. Oh, yep. Included the wrong one. Okay. So then this is your pay amount summary, and that's where if you're going to see um, on the other pay, that is where their deferred um, docs are going to show up now. So if they're running that, um, they can um, check that column to make sure their deferred doc is in there. The LPEs, um, those will show on their regular wage column, and the LPAs will show on the crude wages column. So again, um, between these two columns here. Um, the sorting options, again, you can sort by employee name, number, the pay group building. Um, you have the options to include the select, select, um, select subtotals by the selected sort options. You have that option there. And then again, you can run this report by specific pay groups. Maybe if they're just wanting to see um, selected pay groups, they can also run that. So they have the option here too. So once they verify everything is correct in here, um, once they get all the reports ran, they can go ahead and post the payroll. So then when they get to the post payroll reports, so they're gonna have a post error report. So it just kind of runs, um, verifies everything once again to make sure there's no errors out there before you um, go ahead and post the payroll maybe to accounting or start doing outstanding payables because you can still unpost the payroll yet at this time. So they would have a post error report right here if I had any, but I don't. So my payroll was good. Um, at this time, you can run um, your payroll report again. You want to ver verify the total gross and direct deposit is correct. You can run the payroll item detail report. Again, this is the final one. You want to make sure you verify the data on this one. The budget distribution report will be the final report. And this is what the one that I don't know if the district still uses, but the treasurer needs to sign that, sign off stating that, yes, this is the correct amount that needs to go um, to the bank. And then the pay account distribution report final and the pay item report final. So they can go ahead and process all those reports after they um, posted the payroll. So the next thing they wanna do is payroll processing um, screen. So they wanna go and process payments. So this is um, to go ahead and process um, if they have just uh, people, uh, employees that still get checks maybe, um, or they don't do email direct deposits, um, this is where they would go ahead and process those. So they can click on the checks to create the checks for that employee here, or maybe they have to correct the paper direct deposits to send out to the employees if they still mail those and they don't actually do them by email anymore. This is where this would be done. Um, just go ahead. So you can just do direct deposits. I don't know if I have any. Um, the next thing here I just want to point out is to print all direct deposits options. Um, maybe they want to print um, all the direct deposits, even for email employees. They want to print them all. They can do that by this option here. Um, if they don't, there's just print uh, the direct deposits that people are, are the ones that are not for email direct deposits. And I don't think I have anybody, but I'll select email so it just prints everybody. And then you can, and then you'll just get a file. No, that's probably going to take a little bit. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so it prints my direct deposits. So even printing direct deposits for people that are just regular email. Oh, 
Okay. The next one is your email. So this would be when the districts want to create that file that maybe they'll create it for like 2 a.m. on a Thursday, Friday morning for their payroll. This is where they would do this. I'm not going to go ahead and do it. I want to send it out. Well, these are not real people, but they would enter in a time here of when they want that to be sent out. If, um, if they have multiple bank accounts, they want to make sure they select the right one. And then what are a form are they using? Do they have their default or do they have one that they actually created on their own for the direct deposit form? And they can use that one. Then you would schedule the selected email notices. notices. And then again, if a, um, a person, uh, maybe there was a mistake and you didn't want to send a email no that email notice out to the employee because you caught it at that time, you can go ahead and actually select that employee and get, bring him over. And that would take him out of that email notice. Okay, um, once you schedule that, you can go to utilities and job scheduler and you can verify that the email direct deposit notice um, is sitting out there. So they can verify that and make sure they did schedule it for the right time. Um, it's very small, can't really see it, but here is an example of that payroll submission. Um, and of course I didn't schedule mine. So this is from um, another file and it just says when they're scheduled, who scheduled it so that um, so they can actually verify that and how many direct deposits are going to be sent. So there is a way to go out there and just make sure that they did schedule that. The ACH report and submission. So at this time, they're gonna go ahead and go to your ACH report. You're gonna um, run your submission files for your bank. So I have one right here. That is my one that I just did, my current one. Again, if they want to display all payrolls, they can do that by selecting to display all payrolls. And then they can go ahead and um, select this payroll and that will be generate a submission file. They can look at the report first and then generate the submission file to be sent to the bank. Um, at this time, the districts can go ahead and um, checkbox this to convert pre-notes on the H8 submission file. So all that does is it's going to convert any of those pre-notes over to um, for the next time for when the payroll is ran. Then they will be ran as a live record. But this one time, um, they're going to get a check. And then, but after this run, then those employees will be ready to be sent as a um, ACH to their bank directly for the next payroll. Um, the next one is your ACH report submission. Um, I don't know how, maybe all your districts have this, but if they do, they would need to run this right after their ACH submission. Now, this is the, kind of the point of no return. So once they run this, they cannot unpost. So maybe they wanna make sure before they run this, um, make sure they um, everything else is fine. Maybe this can maybe be one of their last steps if they want, um, because again, this is their point of no return. So they wanna go ahead and include, again, they can include the, um, the payroll that they're doing, generate a report, verify it, make sure it's correct. They wanna generate the ACH submission file make sure, and then go ahead and submit that to their bank. Um, the only, um, the payee for that HSA has to be set up as the electronic payment check true. So they want to make sure if they're not seeing it under there, this is why, because the payee um, for the HSA isn't set up correctly. And they want to make sure that is checked as true under the payee. So only those payees that are set up electronic payments will show um, under the report submission. <clears throat> The next thing is your outstanding payables. So at this time, they can go ahead and start running their outstanding payables. Um, again, they can click on their outstanding, um, click on their reports. Again, each district may run it uh, differently. They might like to run it under the payee or pay item config, payroll by payroll item or payables detail. So either way, they can do that. And if they wanna select maybe just payroll items that are every payroll. 
then they can pay those. Or monthly, it will show underneath um, the um, under end of the grid. So it just depends how they have this selected or if they leave it blank, it will select everybody. So again, it's up to the district how they want to run these payables every pay. They just do the every payroll. Um, I can go ahead and run a report. Now we have the new option, report format, we changed. Now we have it ran where you can run it in CSV or Excel. This was something that was wanted by districts. Um, so they can run it um, three different ways now. And again, they have the option to run the payment cycle. If they leave it blank, it's going to include everybody. Or if they in payroll item configuration, they can run it just by um, a certain payroll item if they like to do that. Again, you have full report and you have your summer report. So I'll just kind of run it so you can see. And then there's your payroll items report. So once they verify that everything looks correct, then they can go ahead um, and select those over to pay. So if I just wanna go ahead and um, select the ones that I need to pay, you can do it by that way, or you can check all the boxes. So again, you can go ahead and post, you can show in the grid as payee, or you can do per item, per item, per pay item configuration. So it'll show the configuration code, or you can show it by the payee. So if I go ahead and post, again, I have my um, date and it has to be in a posting period that's open. So I'm just gonna go ahead and enter my date. Again, they can select their bank account. And then they also can select, are they do it by their third party XML for their um, printing software or do they just print it a PDF check um, through their and print them themselves? So I'll go ahead and the starting check number will automatically be entered for the upcoming next number. So it actually gives you the report of what you just selected. If they're electronic transfer, you'll see the star next to them. And then actually the actual check um, so you can send that to a PDF version and you can um, print that off then. And again, if you're XML, then you also can run it that way if you need to. Okay. Um, once you get that, um, again, if you don't want to print them off at that time, you also have the option to go under payments and go to payee. And then you go to PE payment checks. And here you can select all these all at once if you wanna get everything um, set up and, and, and outstanding checks done and you wanna do it individually or something, um, you have the option to print all these checks all at once. So here they can do that and then you just print the checks. So the next thing is, um, oh, the output, yeah, file name, um, which we just did. Okay, sorry, got ahead of myself. Okay, so once you got all your outstanding checks done and they're ready to go, um, the next thing you can do, clear some of this out so you don't have so much open. Um, now you have to send, they need to do their source pay report. So then they would go to the report source pay report they will enter in the appropriate pay date, pay cycle, pay cycle code, and the beginning end of dates for that payroll. They click generate and they wanna verify to make sure all the employees have their days and hours and also verify that their earnings and contributions are correct. Um, the member earnings, um, that will be coming from the 400 applicable gross of the payroll item and then the employer pickup, um, that uses the 590, 690 employer amount withheld. So they wanna make sure they verify that those amounts are correct before they create the submission file. 
So when they are creating that submission file, they have two ways they can do the um, generate it and then they can generate the submission file. And then in this also, we have our link that will link you directly to eSearch. So they can just click on that and it directly, directly takes you to the eSearch site and they can um, type in their user ID and submit it. The next um, step would be your STRS per pay report. Again, that's under reports and STRS per pay. So here they will have to make sure that they um, generate their report and they can click the one I just did. So that will create the one for the one um, we just did on our payroll, generate the report. You can create the submission file next or you can do it all at once. Generate the submission file and submit to STRS. Now this one can be a little tricky because you're generating the file um, and submitting it um, all at once. So just remember, a reminder that um, it's doing it for you. Um, again, if they create the submission file and save it at a later time on their desktop, then they can go back and choose that file and actually upload that and then once they upload that, I will show right here in this right next to choose file, and then they can submit the upload file to STRS. So it's kind of, they have a couple options on the STRS report option. Um, also, um, let's see, you can verify and make sure um, that the contributions match um, the employees 591 and 691s, and they can use those from the payables payroll item detail report. So they can verify those, um, the two reports together. We did that. We did that. And then um, again, if they don't utilize those um, buttons there that actually um, link you right to, directly to the SERS and SERS, ESERS, um, they can go ahead and, and go to those um, sites on their own if they prefer. If that's in their checklist, um, they can do that at that time. So now before submitting file, your payroll file to USAS, you wanna do two things. You wanna make sure that you have your um, go into USAS and you wanna make sure your account, synchrony, um, account synchronized, you wanna make sure you do this. So that way it's syncing with your USAS and they wanna make sure that's getting submitted and make sure if any accounts that were created um, that USAS and um, payroll are gonna to talk to each other. And a lot of times districts kind of hurry on this and they you know, say, well, it isn't working. We're still getting that the payroll account isn't um, created. Um, it's not, um, not matching. And this is probably why, because they're rushing this and they probably just click on it and they leave and then they go ahead and start trying to do the payroll submission to uh, USAS. Um, actually, they have to wait until this is done, the submitted to USAS and make sure that says that. That means the system has linked between the two systems and, and then they're good to move on. So they just kind of have to be um, patient to make sure it says completed. And then again, um, you go to the USAS um, submission or, or um, integration, and then you go to the payroll submission and you're gonna pick up that file and then do posts to USAS. And here it says not submitted yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and just submit it. And it says it's submit to USAS. I do have my USAS side set up here. So let's see if it reads out each other. Let's move that over. Okay. So if you go to USAS now and go to the pending transactions. Hopefully, yep, it's, there it is. So actually they can verify that it did get sent and it's sitting out there waiting for the USAS site to go ahead and um, import it in. So it's just another step to verify um, that they got they received it.
And then you can see here, I'll go back to my payroll listing and it says pending. So they're waiting for the um, payroll or the use size to pick it up. So once they get that, um, then they, it will um, either say post, reject or validate. So again, they can double check that to make sure those two um, are linking together correctly. Okay, so the next thing is your um, afford. Um, you wanna go to afford under reports, you enter a beginning date and ending date. Um, then you could check include employees with no retire hours on the CSV. You can check the include based on the terminated um, date box, exclude employees with the insurance box, or calculate based on number of weeks. So again, they will need to make sure that they get their afford calendar ran and click generate to um, create the report. And the next thing they would do is process the employer distribution report. Again, they enter the start and end date, select the payroll items that they wish um, to include on there and click generate report. And then they would need to go to the USAS side of side uh, on under here. And then they, once they get those um, employer distribution submissions um, created, then they would go here and they would submit those over um, to USAS. Same thing would be for the employer retirement. They would, if they use, if different districts use the employer, employer retirement share, then they would go ahead and enter that information in create the report, then they go to USAS and create the employer retirement share file and submit it over to USAS. Again, they can do under USAS and then they would go to the employee pending and those files should be listed here. Okay. All right, so we went to the retirement share. The next thing would be the remit taxes. Um, they want to make sure they remit all their federal and Medicare taxes. Um, make sure they submit their state taxes to OBG um, for their city taxes and make sure they submit their OSDI. Again, they might submit those monthly. Um, so it just depends how the district is submitting those files or if they maybe create checks or maybe they do it electronically. The reports to run it at quarter end. Um, again, we prefer districts to run the quarter report every, probably after every payroll, because this will help with balancing, because if they have a balancing issues at the end of that payroll, um, well, they, then they know that it's sometime in that time frame and they can get that corrected at that time. Um, again, they can run it at, at the end of each quarter and balance it with the W-2 year to date totals. And also they can run it, um, compare it to their earnings register to make sure that what their earnings register is stating what they ran for that payroll is for that um, at that time of that quarter report. So again, up to the districts if they wanna run it after each payroll or they can run it at each quarter end in balance, but really important that they do that either way. Um, run W2 report, they can run that at time. They can run it for errors only to make sure that maybe no uh, errors popped up during this last payroll. Um, maybe they need to clean up some um, refund of annuities, make sure they don't have to do adjustments for those. So that way at W-2 time, they're not running into a huge less mess of errors. And then they're trying to figure that out at this, that time. It's easier if they start running it, um, maybe after every payroll, just put it on their balancing sheet and say, yeah, we're gonna run it and make sure that no problems uh, arose during this payroll and they're clean. So it, at W-2 time, um, it would be a lot smoother for them. Um, also, um, the month end reports, once they close that posting period, then the month end reports will come over in the quarter end reports. So it all, it goes off that posting period change. So when they close that um, month, then month end reports will automatically go out to file archive and same thing goes when they're changing over to the new quarter under posting period, then the quarter end reports will get automatically created. So the month end reports, the quarter end, excuse me, if you create the following reports, 
um, the monthly reports when they close that month and, and start a new month for payroll, attendance journal report, leave balance report, payment transaction status report, and STRS monthly report will get automatically created and put out under file archive for them. For the quarter reports, um, when they change over that posting period, um, attendance journal report, leave balance report, payment transaction status report, employee master report, earnings registers all go out there at that time in quarter report. So again, if they need to go out and look at some um, quarter end reports, they have that option and it gets all get created for them. So the next thing they want to do then is process their leave accruals. So again, they would go under um, processing, benefit update and projection, which would be under pay, um, excuse me, processing, processing, outstanding payables, and um, oh, geez, excuse me, got the wrong one. There we go, under accruals. So you want to again um, run the report in um, projection, and you want to verify to make sure all those um, employees. Um, are correct in showing. Again, the bin accrual probably, maybe the districts run it once a month in the beginning of the new month, or maybe they run it quarterly. Um, again, they have, every district can be different. But this is how they would run their accruals for their sick leave or vacation if they accrual monthly. They can do this using this um, option here under the accrual. Then once they verify it, then they want to go ahead and run it in accrual. And that will actually um, accrual each employees and give them their extra um, monthly accrual amount. Okay, any questions on the payroll processing? We kind of went through it fast. I still have configurations and monitor and modules to go through. So we'll try to get through as much as we can on those. Um, the next one is we're going to be going through configuration and configurations under system. And we're going to be going through most of these, not all of them, and some I'll go through a little bit detail and some not. I have a lot of explanations on um, in our PowerPoints that um, we kind of detail it out. Again, if you have questions, please let us know. Okay, so the account mapping configuration would be our first one. And what these are used for, um, this will allow us to determine, like, if the employee is getting paid out of their regular payroll account, but they don't want, like, certain um, instructional level, the job level, operational, OPU, uh, special cost center, or subject, they want to use uh, different use those different numbers for them for the account mapping. This is what this is for. So it doesn't get charged to their employee salary. It will be charged to create a benefit account using the, these account mapping features. So again, this is just if different districts automatically just want it to be um, created for them and it, it knows to um, use a benefit account that's under the payroll item configuration under the certified and classified in the um, object area. This is where that's picking those up from. So if they want to change, um, for instance, the OPU, if this box is checked, then it means that when a benefit account is created on the system, maybe leave projection or um, employer distribution, um, this user uh, would then use the OPU that is charged for the employee's pay to be carried through all their benefit um, accounts. Same thing goes for the special cost center. If this flag is referring to all the special account centers under the 9,000, so if this is checked, um, then this will be automatically be carried through all their benefits. So again, the count mapping um, is just used if they want to use that, um, use like use the instructional level from the payroll account when mapping to the benefit account, they can do this by using this account mapping feature. And again, every district is different, so they can use um, select which ones they want, or maybe they just have one checked. Maybe the OPU is the only one that they checked. Again, they can use that um, on how they want the accounts to be created. Okay. 
Okay, the next one is the system configuration. Um, this would be for districts that use the advanced sick leave configuration. Um, that would be this one here. Again, you have your, um, it will allow districts to set up a time period for the system to automatically reset their advanced sick leave. So if they have the advanced units use, um, will reset um, automatically either at the fiscal year or a calendar year, or again, they can do a custom and it automatically will reset itself every time that posting period gets changed into the new fiscal year or the new calendar year. The system knows that if they, if they use the advanced sick leave. So then it would just reset and reset to zero for them. They don't have to go in there and um, clear those out every fiscal year. The system will do it for them. There we go. I was just going to go leave so you can see where that, what I'm kind of talking about. The advanced unit will be this line here. Okay, where are we at? Okay, then the next option is that advanced payoff in here. Allow the payoff of advanced balances. So if this is checked, then this field is always available. It means the accumulations will decrease the advanced units used in the lease and then will allow the employee to reuse those advanced sick days during that period. So every time, um, every time the employee uses those and the accumulations, um, it will decrease that advanced unit. So sometimes districts only allow five per year and that's it. Now, if they allow more and they can use those units as much as they want of those five days that they gave them, the max amount, because I'll have the max, max amount set down here of five or 10, whatever they have that district wants, um, it will just keep um, the accumulations will start taking off of that amount so they can just keep reusing it each time. Now, if they leave it unchecked, um, that accumulation will not affect those advanced units. So once they hit that max amount of five or 10, they're done. They cannot take any more um, advanced days and then they will get an error stating that they have passed their sick days. Okay, we did that. That now, um, yeah, okay. And I yeah, went over the can't a custom start dates. Again, this is where they would enter that if they do use the custom period start dates. I think most districts go off the fiscal year, I believe. So okay. Um, the application configuration. Um, this one they probably want to be very careful with. Um, usually it's defaulted to the support. Um, with the notifications um, in jobs, these are unchecked. Um, I kind of tested it, um, just copying test files and that came up as support and notification in job was um, not checked. Um, when configuring a non-production instance, again, maybe this is for training or testing that you might be using, um, they can, you, you will want to use the production. Um, this can be used to prevent um, maybe if you're using districts, copy of districts files, and if you schedule, and if you're in um, not in production, it will actually schedule jobs and notifications and actually send them out to those employees. So they got you got to be very careful with what instance type you have selected here. So that way you're not if you're doing some testing, um, so it doesn't send out like the email um, direct deposit notices or something like that. So this is what this is for in testing. Um, again, if you have um, more questions on that, we have a technical documentation out there um, for a link here that you can go to. Um, if you're, I, if you have your, um, I, I, maybe your text can help you with that. I am not very um, clear what all these do, but I just know ours is always set to support, but again, you can use the non-production um, for your training. Um, I do have it out here, kind of just broke down what each one means. 
like your production would be your default production mode, your support would be your uh, typically your copy, which we, what we do when we copy districts files. Um, training, maybe you're doing a training instance typically contains your um, anonymized data and so does the demo. And then reserve for use by SSDT is the development one. So again, you can use that link and if you have more questions on that. Um, the password requirements allow users to make changes to the user password. Um, again, they can set the minimum length of the password. Um, you can require mix or um, mix case or numeric values for the password. Again, the password can be set for a number of days between the required password and pre-expired if the user password is changed by the administrator. Um, again, so that password be immediately expired. And then when they try to log in and again, then they will have to change that password immediately. So this is just um, usually it's for the admin or ITC or the IT of your of the districts, and they can go ahead and set that up. And this is for all employees then. If this is set up, this is going to hit everybody um, how their password is set up and expires. The next one is to check void message configuration. Again, um, if they don't want that void message to state void after 90 days, or if they don't want a message, they can um, just um, clear that out and save it. If they don't have that where it voids in a certain amount of time. So I'm gonna be going through these kind of quick, running out of time. Um, the system configuration for the deferred absent posting. Now this feature allows uh, the deferred absent postings of attendance and import records for the absence of your sick vacation and personal. So if they have this checked, then this, excuse me, I'm getting tongue tied here. There we go. Okay. So under the systems configuration, um, it contains the field if deferred posting is to be used, then you would check that mode. And what that does, go ahead. Um, if they don't check it under, then this will cause your benefit balance to update when the attendance entry is entered. So some districts like that deferred absence, they don't wanna see those attendance um, entries to be updated automatically. I mean, right at the time that they save that entry and then that'll update their balances. If they want it to, to be deferred absent postings until that time, um, when they run it through payroll, then they want to check that box. So that's the difference between having it checked and unchecked. It just depends what your district wants to do. Deferred absent posting, leave it unchecked. If they want it, their balances to update automatically and um, instantly. If they have it checked, then they want to, um, then what they'll do when they add that entry in, it won't update. And actually what it'll do, it'll sit out here under unapplied usage. And it will sit out there until that, that attendance or absence is included, or absence, excuse me, is um, included in that payroll that they're running. Until that time, it will sit out here and show as that amount. Then once that payroll is posted, this will update and um, adjust their balances then. And I have a screenshot here that that's where this unimplied usage, if they have that box deferred checked. For the EMIS configuration, um, this is only for when after the EMIS has sent their file, um, probably usually in August um, is when that gets submitted for EMIS reporting. Uh, we did add a new warning this year. Um, if anybody in the district tries to update that update that um, fiscal year too soon, it's gonna throw a warning. It will let you change it, but it's gonna throw a red warning out there and state, um, are you sure you wanna change this? Through May 1st and August 31st, when somebody's trying to go in there and change it way too soon, you're gonna get a warning pop up on that. Now, if they try to um, change it during the, um, not within those May 1st and August 31st states, then they won't get a warning because people were changing it too soon. And when they're running the reports, they weren't getting the correct data pulled in. 
Okay. Uh, the ZID prefix, this is a prefix after the ZIDs. Um, this is for um, EMI, EMIS um, when you're setting up your um, ZID numbers for your um, classified employees. So when you're creating a new employee and they're classified, this is where they can set this up and it automatically, um, oh, excuse me. No, this is not, sorry. Um, yes, it is, sorry. I'm like in my field. Uh, the ZID number, um, this is practically will be always be set up for districts. Um, since it since it came over from classics, I guess it would be for new redesign employee or districts that come in. Um, they will need to um, make sure that their fiscal year is correct and make sure the reporting ID and the ZID is entered. So the reporting ID will be, um, they can decide which one that will be. Again, that usually it comes over from classic. So um, it can be social security number, employee ID, or credential ID. And again, the fiscal year, this is where they would change that. And then the ZID prefix. Um, again, this is probably going to be different for every district. And I'm assuming they get that number from the EMIS um, team of what that prefix should be. The next is the email configuration the email configuration, email direct deposit notices. Again, at this time, they can set this up. Um, this should be all set up already. If not, they can ask their ITC or IT and their department of how that should be set up. Um, we kind of did go through, um, I think, okay. So the default administrator address, again, this would be something similar to the root at MX server name. The default address would be your true email address of the sender. The password would be the district. Would, um, the district would have to ask their IT department for that password. The port, again, this would be coming from the IT department and the SMTP host. So the I, your IT will give you all that information to have that set up. Again, this should probably be set up um, for all districts now. So if, again, if you have questions, you have to go to your IT. Okay, the next one is your email um, direct deposit notice configuration. Um, this is for any emails that they're sent for the direct deposit notifications that you do during um, after payroll when you select when you send your email. Um, all this is is just from email. Um, they want to enter in the email address of the person who is sending the notifications. Um, on the subject line, um, it's already out there for them. It's just it states um, direct deposit notice for that date. So when they run the email notices this date will automatically populate or enter a date of that pit road date. So nothing really needs to be done on this. Now, again, um, they can add a different, um, a no, more of a body in here if they like. If not on the email notice, it will just um, state that attach this message in your direct deposit notice and it'll insert that pay date of which they're running automatically for them. Um, the send notifications to all addresses, um, some districts like to send um, emails out to everybody, even if they're just paper direct deposits, or maybe, um, so they have that option now to do that. So they can choose to send it to all or only to the primary email address. Excuse me, I stated that wrong. That notice is only for whether um, they want to send it to, there's like three, I think, email addresses on the email uh, under the employee, and they can send that to all of those email addresses, or they can send it to only the primary email address. So maybe they have a home and when they have work and maybe a second one, they can send it to all those. If they don't, if they wanna send it to only the primary one, then you just leave it unchecked. Under, okay, the next one is your employee number automatic uh, generation. If districts utilize this, um, they wanna make sure they have this set up correctly. This is just to utilize your um, number. So when they're creating a new employee, 
they have the options for the uh, automatically generate employee ID. So they wanna make sure they have this checked. They also wanna make sure they have their increment set up. How many, um, do you want seven numbers or nine? How many should your numbers be? Number of letters, how many you can use uh, last name. You can go up to one to four on here. And the start value, what is the value of the employee number? What do you want it to start at? Every 10, every 20, again, up to the district how they want this to be set up. So again, the increment, you can go from zero to 100. Number of letters is zero to four for the, um, if you wanna use the last four digits of your, the employee's last name and the start value. You can go zero to up to all those 999s. If they're not wanting to use the employee last name, so they would just probably enter zero, then they can enter in the starting digits of what they want their employee numbers to start at. So then if they enter it at 078, 100,000, then the next employee at it will automatically go by one. So again, it's up to the district how they want to utilize that. If they don't like want to use the MPIDs automatic, then they can leave that unchecked and they can create their own every time they um, create a new employee. The employee retirement share configuration. Um, this is for the retirement share. Um, district was, we had some requests for districts wanting to only utilize employer distribution accounts that are set up for the employee under payroll accounts. So when they're creating that retirement share, um, retirement share um, report, um, it's only including all those employees that are employer distribution accounts only. They didn't want to see any other accounts that were non-employer distribution accounts. So we came up with this configuration. They can go ahead and check that box. So then the next time they run employee retirement share, it's only going to include those employees under payroll accounts that have that employer distribution account set. If they don't mind having both non-employer distribution accounts and employer distribution accounts in their employer retirement share um, report and um, submission, then they can leave that unchecked. Totally up to the districts how they prefer that. Okay. Um, the fiscal year, um, mostly all districts are on a fiscal, which is um, July starting. I don't know if any that are in a calendar year. So this is just a uh, fiscal year beginning month is July and that should never change. The last count transaction configuration um, again, every time you run the account change transition found in USAS and you sync it with payroll, that account sync here, um, that you can go back here to this um, system in the last account and it will show you the last time they actually were synced. So if you're having problems and accounts don't seem to be syncing or something, you can go in and check. And if it's saying the timestamp was two weeks ago, then there's a problem. Or if it was um, saying that it was today, then there's a, then there was something else um, might be going on. The ODGFS, if the districts want to submit their own, they have to come into the configuration, make sure this um, checkbox is checked. District will submit own file to ODGF and then go ahead and enter in the highlighted information. Um, overtime, if districts allow, uh, use the overtime code configuration, um, allows you to um, enter the certified or classified object codes for overtime um, charging. And then here is a breakdown of how uh, this overtime codes um, are found. Um, we included that here in this, in, the um, PowerPoint and the ones that are highlighted. This is how we come up with those. The next thing is the payment printing configuration. Um, this allows districts to set up how they wanna print their direct deposits and checks. Um, the check pay. So here they can do, um, they can um, 
select if they have default, if they have a different form that they created on their own, they can say, yep, I want that one to use instead. Same thing goes for direct deposit. Like I have a test one here, so they can use that if they're um, using it for printing, automatically brings up that one first and not the default. Um, again, how many limits do they wanna check on the pay limits, payroll items and check position limits to be printed on their checks or the direct deposits. Again, this is up to the district, how many they wanna show on their limits. Okay. Ah, okay. I'm gonna go to the next. System configuration, the payroll account default setup. Um, this one is when they're creating um, new payroll accounts for employees. Um, districts ask if we have a configuration that they can check. So these boxes are automatically checked when they're creating the payroll account and they don't have to do extra steps and check those two. So when they're creating the payroll accounts, these two boxes automatically checked. Now, if they don't want those checked because um, sometimes they have a, a specific accounts that they're creating um, are not subject to employer distribution or leave projection, then um, they can leave, um, leave these two unchecked and they can decide if they're gonna check those boxes when they're creating the payroll accounts themselves. Just an extra save step for districts. Um, the rounding, this allows your pay accounts and contract pay off rounding thresholds and your unit amount decimals. Again, the districts can set this up to what a rounding that they want to show for um, their districts. Um, so the first one would, would be your pay accounts for rounding adjustments. Your second one would be your contract payoff threshold. And the third would be your unit amount decimal positions. And this would be used for your new contract programming program, excuse me. The system configuration we have out there now, we have the STRS advance. So when the um, district is in advance, these, this box will be checked. It will be advance amount. And every time a payroll is ran, the amount will be paid back will show here until these two equal. If there is a difference, then it will be left, um, it will not come out of advance and they can do um, a check to see where that amount is coming from by doing STIRS check. Um, submission timestamp has to be been added now so they can see the actual submission time that it was sent to STIRS. Um, I put it out here a little bit of what each um, field means. I'm not gonna go into detail for them. Um, so we can keep moving. Um, if the district does have to be taken out of advance for correction, there is, this is for ITC only. Um, you can do this by um, going in and checking the advance box. And then they can go ahead and use the mass change and use this mass change procedure to change everybody from true to false. And then they can restart over on their um, advance. So there is a way um, to get them out of advance if they need to do corrections. And we do have that in our documentation. The SERS configuration, um, this minimum salary can change every year, um, just depends. So we keep that updated um, for districts. Um, the URL is the address that's a submission file um, gets um, submitted to, and that shouldn't change. And then the base withholding. Um, now, I think we may have only one district that is on gross or that is on earnings and not gross. And this is where this box would need to be checked for that district. Um, so if if you base it on earnings, then no STRS deductions um, will occur during the summer. And then this is what the system will look at to know that. So if that is checked, once they run the STRS advance, but I had it in there, it's not. Um, what it'll do then that STRS advanced configuration field, um, no amounts will be entered in there. So um, this has been added because we did have one district out there that was um, based on earnings and they um, didn't want to have their 
SERS Advance for, um, for the summer months for their teachers. Okay. Um, specific account search limit. Um, the default is um, always checked as limit account search. This is something that was just added, I think maybe a couple months ago. I can't quite remember. Um, it affects both the current and future pay amounts and searching for a specific counts. So when they're in current and future and they're searching for um, specific counts to add maybe for an employee, um, it will limit them what they can see. So if they have that checked limit account search, then they're only going to be in to include the one XX. Now, if they leave that on check, they're going to be able to see all accounts, grants and everything. So um, it's up to the districts how they want that set for their employees. Um, so what they can see and select. Maybe um, treasurers don't want their employees to use any other accounts but one XX. So this is just an um, extra step for them that they can put in there and protect them from using any other accounts. The transaction configuration, um, this is just the highest check number. Um, usually I think a lot of districts just put it at the highest nine nine um, to be used. Um, this allows the districts to direct the highest um, transaction number um, in the system. So for example, if the uh, payment checker shows these four um, up to 1,003, and then they also have a 20,540. Uh, 20, um, if they have that set, if you go into um, process checks, so your check, next check number would be 20,541. And if that um, transaction configuration um, allows the user to enter the ceiling, so they can enter as high as they want, and then that highest check number will be ignored. So if you enter the 20,540 in that transaction configuration right here, and then when you process your check number, it will start the check number would be 1,004. So it's going to ignore anything below that and it will start right at the 1,004. Um, the use as configuration. Um, okay, so this one here, got to get what that's for here. This should be automatically all set up. Um, again, the ITC probably would have to um, get that information. IT at your district or at the district will have to get that information. Um, again, this right here, this nightly USAS account sync. Um, if they want it to sync nightly for them so they don't have to do it every morning when they get into their system, they can do that now. And then what they would do is create that crone expression um, and put in there if they wanted to run at two o'clock in the morning, they can do that now, as long as this check and that crone expression is in there. So again, they wouldn't have to account sync every um, day before they get in or in the morning when they get in, if they have something they forgot. Now they automatically can do that and, and it's set up. And this is where they would do that right down here. Okay. The system configuration. The W-2, now districts have their option to create and submit their own W-2s. So they can go ahead and make sure when in the system configuration, they want to submit her name and address, same as company. They want to make sure that information is entered um, before they um, start. And again, we have documentation on everything that has to be entered um, for that W-2. And here's an example of everything that has to be entered in order for them to submit their own W-2 or submit their submission file and create. Um, we are on the process of creating, um, it should be done before calendar year, um, I think it's out there now actually, they can create their own W-2s in PDF form. 
Um, so that that is in the works now, and we'll be going over that more at calendar year end meeting. Um, the workflows, workflow, if employee districts are using the workflow, they want to make sure that they have the workflow configuration selected and, and um, checked. And then that will show up here on your on top of the screen workflows. This button will actually appear then if that configuration is set. And then they also want to make sure that they turn on the workflow module first, too, because they have to have the workflow module and then they have to go to configuration and check that employee onboarding for that to all show. So they need the workflows first and then the employee onboarding, then that will show here. So module, workflows, employee onboarding shows the employee onboarding for the configuration. The next one is the EMIS contractor module. The EMS contractor module, this is a setup of the um, EMS screen. Okay, I'm gonna have to pause just for a second. Sorry. Sorry, somebody was at my door. <laughs> they want my dog to bark. Okay, back to this. The EMIS contract module. Oh, we're into modules. Okay, sorry. So the last thing was the workflows and the configuration. And is there any, um, have anything to address on the configurations? We kind of went through it fast. So please, if you have any questions, please let me know. We can go through it again. Um, we still have two more to go through. Um, the next one would be our modules. So the system module, EMIS contractor module, this module is used to set up the EMIS contractor option um, in the EMIS entry. So the modules will be under system. And then these are how you turn on each one so they can see those um, certain reports, like the EMS contractor module. When they have that clicked, then you will be able to see under EMIS entry that turns on the EMIS um, contract service for the CJ. Email notification module. Um, that will, um, if that is checked, um, this module will turn on. So when you're running um, in your payroll, when you're initialized payroll, you're going to see that email notice. This is how that module gets on by processing um, payroll detail screen. And here's an example when you're in payroll processing. Once it's already started, you're going to see the email notice. This is how that button gets turned on. Otherwise, they won't be able to see if that module isn't turned on. Employer distribution module, again, for these two, um, you have to make sure that is checked for employer distribution and employer distribution submission. Otherwise, they will not see that under, under the reports and under the USAFs. So that's how those two button, how those reports in that submission option gets um, appears. And then the USAS integration employer distribution screen. Um, oh, that's a continue. Um, and once that's checked, that'll be, um, like I said, we'll, you'll be able to see that under the reports in USAS. The same goes for the employer retirement share module. If once that is, um, check, then you can go ahead and now they'll be able to see same thing, employer retirement share under reports and under USAS integration for those modules. Okay.
The next thing. Yeah, just screenshots. The next thing is your file archive. So now if you want your districts to see the file archive, this is another module that has to be turned on. So your file archive, you wanna make sure those three are set. And when you do that, then they'll be able to see all your file archive under utilities. This option will appear. So again, under file archive, then you will see your payroll archive, payrolls from classic or process and um, redesign. You have your pay form archive, pay slips from classic. You have your W-2 archive, which is your W-2s from classic, which um, they can bring over. So they have those um, set up here and they can be able to go back and see those. Um, and then we have the other, which is your legacy report. Some districts may wanna save some reports from the past. So they can go ahead and load those in and bring those in and keep those right here. And then now we have the audit reports, which is your audit and your uh, SO, SOC one audit and your district audit. So we have the options to save those under um, the audit reports now. And then the file archive also turns on that file import. So um, they also will be able to see these three options. The next thing would be your system bonds for your file transfer. Um, this is just modules to turn, in, um, turn on in order for email directed um, posit notice to, to be sent. So they want to make sure that is uh, set, but most of the time these should be all set up already. Um, maybe when they're coming over to redesign, they might just have to do a check to make sure that these are turned on. HTTP notification services. This is another module that they can turn on in order to send email direct deposit notices out. So those are the two, um, the two that they probably want to make sure that they have set up. The notification services, they want to make sure this is turned on because this is another one that needs for an order for email direct deposit notices to be sent out. The LDAP directory, um, this is a lightweight directory ac access, and I think this is just a software protocol for enabling anyone to locate data about the organizations, individuals, or other resources such as files and devices. Again, this is up to the ITC. Um, in the district, probably your IT, um, if they want this installed. So if they want um, anybody to be able to, enabling anybody to locate stuff about that district. So they able to either turn that off or on. The leaf projection module, this would be, um, if they wanna be able to see the leaf projection report, they wanna make sure that they have um, this set. So that would be to turn on this report here and also to see it over here under use as. So that's what that module will turn on. The next one is their mass change service. Uh, maybe um, certain ITCs don't want to have their districts to give that mass change to them. So um, they have the option to actually show that module then. Um, if they don't want to, then they can just leave that unchecked and uninstalled and districts will not see that mass change procedure anywhere located under like any of these um, features. So it's up to the district or ITCs if they want their districts to be able to do that and they only want them uh, or they just want uh, you at the ITC to be able to do any mass change procedure. So this is where that would be turned on or off so they couldn't get see that feature at all. Okay, the next thing, um, the core screens, um, the only ones that don't have the mass change is the EMIS entry, the CC. 
the CC does have the option to mass change employer personnel, position personnel, and leaves only for accumulations. So mass change is only available for leaves or for the accumulations. As of right now, we don't have it under just leaves and posting periods don't have it either. The tax estimator, if they wanna be able to see that tax estimator, this is another one that they have to turn on. And, and again, once that is turned on, then it's going to be under utilities and they'll be able to see that tax estimator module. Um, another one is the USAS integration modules. So some districts, um, maybe they want some employees to be able to see and, and do the sub submissions to USAS. If they don't want to see them, then they don't want to turn on that module. Um, but in order for them to see, they have to have that module on and that will open up this whole, add this whole option up here. Otherwise they won't see this integration at all. Um, let's see, the next one. Again, this one would be more for your um, IT, probably their technical users um, to get this set up. Um, again, that's just another module that they can turn on for external authentication services. And if they want that on, then they would just um, go ahead and Windows Director, I believe is what that is right there. Windows Directory Service Authentication. The last thing would be um, the workflows. Again, this is the, another one that the workflows um, module would need to be um, turned on. And if they wasn't turned on, then they wouldn't see this workflows tab right up here. So that's another one that probably would need to be turned on if they're if the district is utilizing that workflows. And again, if they have any questions on the workflow, um, once they uh, turn these on, there's still more steps that a, a district has to do or ITC has to do to get the district set up for that. And I workflow installation guide and also the workflow documentation for payroll. So I included both links for them um, because once they get those modules set up, they still have to do a little bit more um, setting up in order for them to start utilizing that workflows for employee onboarding. So I included that for you. Uh, the last thing that we have is the system monitor. Um, we're going to be going through a few of these. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of them because a lot of them are for our developers. And um, so I won't be going through some of them. And that is located under system and monitor. So the first thing would be your events. Um, again, the admin advanced permission is needed to view the view the tabs under monitor. So again, if maybe a lot of the district's employees won't even see this because they don't need to. So if but if they do, they need the admin um, events to get, see that. And um, and we're admin, so probably all of you at the ITC will see these. Um, this redesign applications. Um, so what these are for from monitoring, you can do statistics, logging levels, and various logs that can be useful in diagnosing some problems if they in the, within their application. So the events grid, it will list the last 200 application events that it logged. So again, you have a couple of the, if you click underneath, you'll see a couple of different, the slow, slow metric events, and it'll tell you when they were ran and um, the elapsed time. And again, developers probably will use this if there's probably a reporting of something um, event is taking too long, long to run, they can look at this and see um, kind of what's going on. And then it just runs with the recent repository events that were ran. 
the life cycle of the events. And recent exceptions. And then ones that are audible, they can go in and see which ones um, actually are audible events that it created, like the payroll post complete event created audible, payables posted created an audible. So if they don't see, um, they go out and don't see where this, uh, something didn't get created under audit, if they were running an audit report, they can go in and see actually what has, what does get created um, as an audible event. And it will list here the summary of that. And then again, this is another one probably for our developers. It's just a uh, recent metric events and what was um, created. So like report generated, like when I created my check payments, it states that payable payments is just um, recording that. And, and then the elapsed time of how long it took, I guess, of or each one. Okay. Um, again, the recent repository, that's just a database access, and this includes the queries and updates and creates that it shows. Uh, the slow queries, again, queries that take longer than one second to complete. Again, the developers could use this to see if there was an issue going on. Uh, the lifecycle events, these are just showing the startup shutdowns out of importing information. You have your recent audible events, again, module installations, rules uploading, payroll posting, et cetera. And then authentication events. Um, again, they can do uh, troubleshooting through uh, um, authentication troubleshooting in their technical document if um, things, um, if they need to go into further detail of what's going on. And then the recent metric events, um, this again, this is just the elapsed time for, uh, for the events um, that are happening. Again, I think most of it would be used for the IT or um, our developers to show, just to help them out if uh, a district is having issues. The next one is under events. Um, Oh, post submission files to you, SAS. Um, again, this would only this only records when you're sending to you, SAS. So it would be anything that post payrolls to you, SAS, employer distributions and retirement. Um, another one would be from payroll, any PDF, XML, direct deposit or direct deposit XMLs. So that would be shown under events. For the next one would be status. Um, is just to, uh, displays the information um, of the status of the application. Is it running? Are they having issues? Um, and what jobs were installed in what modules? Um, again, each job that runs during the import and post-import process, along with various modules that are installed, will be listed here. So again, they can go in and see um, what modules were um, created. So it's just another place where they can just check out status of their system. The logging tab. Um, this just shows if there was effective errors in the logging. Um, again, um, IT, um, SSDT can use this um, to determine if there's some issues in their law. Um, if they're having a problem, maybe an EMIS, when they're running that, they, we can go in and create a debug for them and, and checking out who the employee is or what position number that is. That's just an example if they had an EMIS um, running their reports. Um, this is just where we would do um, some of our debugging if we have, um, if there's problems with some of their with districts. And this is where we would go to do that debugging. Okay. Um, the app log, 
Um, this would be where we would be able to find if there was errors when something was running, maybe um, a direct deposit notices all didn't get sent or something. Um, this is usually where we would go to find that information out and when it was fired. Um, as you can see here, like today, I submitted the payroll and it's just telling me the event that it submitted. Again, you can check for any errors by typing in error here. And again, um, like here's one I had just recently where that was, I didn't have the account found, um, entered. So I had to go in and it created a app log for that. And again, sometimes if um, districts have these errors and if I, you at IC can't read them, um, usually this is probably where we're gonna wanna get that error exceptional detail from. So you can copy this and send this to us um, and we can read through it. And usually we can send it to our developers if we can't read through it and decipher what the problem is and then let you know. But again, this was one of my errors that I have for that position four for my employee. And it says right there, position four, and it tells me exactly um, what was wrong. So it just kind of keeps, the app log just keeps everything that is going on that people are submitting, um, payroll, anything like that, file archives, submission of direct deposits, email notices, scheduling, you'll find that all here. Um, another thing I just wanna mention, um, you can also have this checked as auto refresh. So it automatically refreshes all the time. As soon as something is event is happening in your, in the district or it, it will read it automatically. They can have that set up. If not, they can do this auto refresh every so often and it will refresh the, the, the log of what's going on. And this is just a detail of the screenshot. Um, again, like you said, error. And if you bring that up, you should be able to see an explanation here at the bottom. So you, when you research that, you'll be able to see that. And again, we can help you with that, um, figuring out what that message is if it doesn't, because sometimes it gives you a good detail and sometimes it doesn't. The next one is the admin log. And this one is for your classic when they're um, coming over from classic importing into redesign. Um, this is your admin log. And a lot of times we'll use this to see and make sure it's completed status that when they were um, importing over um, that they didn't have any problems coming over from classic. Um, this is what that log is. I don't have anything in my test document, but that would show a line here. As you can see here, you can barely see it, but a classic import log. And if you view that, it opens that up and you can show everything that has, um, if there were some, maybe some errors or problems or the status was incomplete or failed, we can find that out here. The next thing is the server log. Um, this contains downloadable links to various um, log files that were, um, were related to applications that were running. So in this one, so here, um, a lot of them are used by our um, developers if they need um, files or to look at something. Um, so I won't go into detail on a lot of them. Um, the download web docker, um, this is used to download files. Um, so if you use a download web, there we go. It creates a .json file for the, um, for the developers that they, uh, you can create for them and you can send that to them and then they can do um, a search in that. And it creates a .j, j, uh, .json file for them and it gives them information of what they might need. And then the other thing would be um, sometimes um, uh, SSDT will ask you to send a server log. And that other server log would be under help and about. And down here at the bottom, if you send server log to SSDT, it will send a log directly to the developers. And then um, they will pick up that file and they can start searching if there is a problem in your um, 
in the, in the files, in the district files. So if they ask to send a server log, this is where you would do that. And they can read everything from that, what they may need. And I have that included here. So that way, in case, um, if you need to go back and look at the PowerPoint, um, the instructions to do that. Um, okay, I think we're over a little bit, um, not too bad. Does anybody have any questions on the monitor, um, modules, configurations? Okay, Lori and I will be going over the next part, which is our, uh, where is it? Posting period, she's going to be, I think, be going through core stuff, I believe. Okay. Lori Knight, it's all yours. Okay. Oh, do we take a five minute break? Sure. Okay. Um, how about we just regroup, <clears throat> excuse me, at 11 o'clock? Will that work for everybody? mode. Um, Andrew did a wonderful job of getting through a lot of information in the last couple hours. Um, so we're going to wrap up this morning um, talking about posting periods and then also about supplementals. Um, so hopefully your mind can take a little bit um, more this morning and you know hope to get done here um, at noon and stay on schedule. So posting periods. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with um, you know, the importance of those by now, um, but we thought we would touch upon, um, you know, maybe what you can and can't do, um, you know, what posting periods are controlling and those sorts of things. So again, um, a posting period, you know, unlike classic, <clears throat> you're no longer um, clearing anything. So everything is happening behind the scenes, um, you know, in a database that's maintained and um, updated um, that we can't really see, but then it displays certain information on, um, you know, in the application and, and that's all controlled on uh, a date. Um, so, which is a posting period. So as you're all familiar with, everything in redesign is date driven, right? So in the upper right hand corner, um, as you're making, um, or the districts are making those posting periods um, current, um, that then tells the district they're actually processing within that time period. So that's controlling what they may or may not be able to do. Um, there's three um, different types of posting periods, and I'm sure you're all familiar with those. It's they're current, open, or closed. You can only ever have one posting period current, okay? And you can have multiple periods open or closed. And we're gonna kind of talk about the importance of, you know, opening and closing those um, as well. So what that does is it really allows you flexibility um, within processing. So if you remember back to classic, you actually had to complete month end steps quarter and closing steps, fiscal year, calendar year. And that was very specific, you know, and if you didn't have certain steps processed, then you, you know, the district was not able to go any further. Um, by using posting periods instead, that allows districts flexibility. One being, if they have the posting period open, um, they can begin entering information for their next payroll. So say they haven't truly closed, um, you know, the month of September, but they're ready to begin their October processing. They can leave September open, make, um, create their posting period for October, um, make that open as well, um, and begin entering that information, okay? Then when they're done, um, you know, they've truly closed September, they can actually go back and close that and then make October current. So you can begin a, a payroll um, process with a period being open, 
But if the district goes to post that payroll, then that's when that posting period has to be current. So where do I need those figures to be applied to? I don't want them to apply, apply to September's figures. I need them applied to October. So that's the importance then of then making that month um, current so that those that information gets applied to the right month, quarter, fiscal year, um, calendar year. Okay, so you can see here is the grid then that I'm sure you're all familiar with um, that actually allows you to view, you know, is a period open? Um, is it closed? Is it current? So I get a little confused sometimes by the icons. Um, they do have nice tooltips um, under them. So if you hover over the checkbox, it's going to say make current. Um, you know, if you hover over the folder, it's going to close or open. So you can, you know, definitely use the icons and the tooltips, or you can also look at the columns then um, to determine, you know, is that period open, closed, is it current or not? Okay. So again, in order to post a payroll, that month has to be current. Again, like I mentioned before, you can have more than one period open at a time. And this is super helpful as, as I said, you know, when it comes to the end of the month and you're ready to start um, just working in the next, um, the first pay of the next month at calendar year in time, um, when you're ready to start your W-2s, um, you, you need to leave December open. And then, um, so you can come back and work on your W-2s but I need to get that January payroll started, right? So you leave December open, you can then make um, January current and you can process that first payroll in January and then come back to your W-2 processing when um, you know, you're ready, okay? Um, I did wanna make mention that you, you, know, you do wanna encourage your districts to close those periods um, once they're truly done with that month. Um, the importance behind that is those month end report bundles that are generated um, or even the fiscal year or calendar year when you're closing those um, certain time, those months of, you know, throughout the year, those are triggers for those report bundles to fire and copy out to the file archive. So if you're leaving months of posting periods open, when you go to close those, then all of those month end reports are gonna look the same. So the one report that always seems to get districts um, because they wanna come back and look at it, um, you know, at, at how, how did my benefits look at that particular time period? So, if you're not closing those periods on a timely basis, all of those benefit reports are gonna have the same information in it. So um, especially in June, um, when auditors come in then after um, you know, the fiscal year to come back and audit that prior year, um, if you don't have a good report in your file archive of your June balances, it's, it is hard to get those balances to reflect what they were at that time period. So again, encourage your districts, you know, it doesn't hurt to leave them open so they can start working in the next month. But once they've officially closed that month, you know, as soon as possible, get those months closed. Okay. Um, just a note on imported um, posting periods, um, they will not be able to go back and open those. Um, we do have a JIRA issue, and I've listed that JIRA issue here. Hopefully, um, hurrah, we've, you know, all um, over 700 districts have been migrated. Um, so there's not any, um, you know, importing happening um, at this time, and there won't be going forward. So hopefully this won't be a problem as we, you know, move further and further away from that time period that they've migrated to the redesign and, you know, the need to go back and reopen a imported posting period. Um, that's going to be a thing of the past here real soon. 
Um, but get, again, just a note that they will not be able to reopen um, those imported posting periods. They can make them current, but we do, you know, want to use extreme caution when doing that. Reason being, you, you know, hopefully took reports um, when they migrated and you balance those classic reports to um, those reports um, that were run um, from redesign, you know, in the beginning. And you, you know, looked at all of those, matched those up, they balance, we're good to go. Now they're going to be live. If you would go back and make any changes, then those reports that you've, quote, kind of signed off on saying that um, things balanced and they're good um, to go live are not going to be the same. Okay. Okay, so we kind of talked about, you know, it's no longer, you know, there's no longer any closing per se. Um, you can reopen prior posting periods if they're not imported, um, if you need to make corrections from a prior month. Um, there are several reports, such as quarter report, that you don't even need to reopen the posting period in order to rerun that report. So the nice thing is, is, you know, again, everything's date driven. So you can go back and select the appropriate quarter. Um, and that quarter report is going to run um, based on that quarter that you selected without reopening any kind of period. Um, a note about ACH submission files. If you do need to regenerate um, an ACH file that's um, from a, pre a prior um, reporting period, you will have to reopen that um, posting period in order to do so. So let me just show you quick here. So right now in my um, set of test files, I have, let's see here. So I have August back to July open, okay? So if I go to regenerate, Oops. Say a uh, ACH file from June, and I gener try to generate that submission file. It's going to tell me that that payroll posting period is not open. So I would go ha have to go back to core posting period and reopen that posting period in order to do so. Now I do want to caution you. Um, you know, make sure that, you know, you keep in mind that there are certain, you know, as we just talked about, report bundles that are generated um, with opening and closing of, of months. So you do want to keep that in mind and, you know, sort of use caution when you're opening and closing those. You can do it, um, but just keep that in mind that that could trigger then when you close um, that month again. Um, a certain set of report bundles um, to be created and copied out to the file archive. So if you don't want that to happen, you know, you might want to disable that bundle. Okay. All right. Just a little bigger so you can see it here. So just a, a common question, um, you know, if the district's first pay of the month is for a date range that includes dates from a prior month, do I have to have both pay um, posting periods open? The answer is no. Um, so the, the system is smart enough to know, you know, there's that lag where, you know, you might be, um, you know, your start date might be in one month, your ending date might be in another. Um, it's really pay date driven. So as long as your pay date is within your current posting period, then you're good. Um, as we talked about before, if you're trying to post a, a payroll um, in a month that's not current, then you're going to get the error. Okay. And again, we talked about the importance of, you know, keeping on top of those, um, closing those months when you're truly done with the month. And reason being, one of those reasons being is the um, file archive, the reports that got, get copied out there. We want those to be as accurate as possible. We talked about like, yes, you can initialize um, the payroll. Um, 
the system will allow you to enter the pay date um, if it's not an open posting period. Um, but again, once the payroll is posted, here's the error then that you're going to get, you're going to receive that says, hey, you, you can't post a payroll um, in a posting period that's not current. Okay, so you'll have to delete the payroll and then open that posting period and then start over. Okay, <laughs> if you're trying to post a payroll with a posting period um, that's current but not open, then you'll also receive um, an error. So you can see here the error that you'll receive um, and then you will have to go in and correct that and make that um, both current and open. Okay, I don't know how often that truly happens, but did want to make mention of that. So let's switch gears and talk about like what you can and you know what what the system's looking at as far as these posting periods go when you when you post various um, um, items throughout the application. So when it comes to creating accumulations just for a specific person, that transaction date can be prior or later than um, a posting period that's open. So again, a lot of these that we go through, you're just, you're gonna see that the posting period just must be open, okay? When it comes to doing the more automated processes of accruals, so your accrual, your reset of personal leave, converting personal leave to pay or sick leave, or um, using that part-time sick leave amount, Option, again, you can see all those periods must be open. When it comes to an adjustment journal, excuse me, again, um, because everything's date driven, the transaction date um, must be within an open posted period. Even if you're modifying or deleting an adjustment, um, you have to make sure that the posting period is open. And I know we find this a lot with, um, you know, maybe like STRS co corrections, you know, after the fact, we have to back post something um, in July and you've already closed June. So that posting period must be open in order for you to backdate that if, if need be. So again, um, you know, what is the system we kind of touched upon this earlier, you know, everything is being tracked behind the scenes and it's then displayed in the application, um, you know, based on that current posting period. So on all the, the records that you see year to date, fiscal year to date, quarter to date, month to date, these are all based on that current posting period. Um, so if that changes, you can see um, how the records change then. So here we have our current posting period set to July. And when we change that to August, you can see here then the, all those month to date totals are zeroed out. Okay. When it comes to the employer, I'm sorry, the employee master report, again, all those to date report, uh, to date amounts are based on that current posting period. So, you know, you're going to see not only in the employee master, but anything that's gathering those totals, you know, is based on that point in time. So you can see here um, in July, we have, again, going back to the month of July being current, you can see that the month to date totals here are 13, you know, the gross is 13,000, the net is 4,000. And if we change that, our um, posting period to be August, and we run that employee master report, you can see now the totals are zero. We haven't posted anything um, in the month of August. Okay, when it comes to adjustment journals, um, when a payroll item refund is done, again, that has to be um, the current posting period. So, Everything is date driven. So that transaction date has to be within the current posting period. So just something to keep in mind when you're talking about adjustment journals and payroll item refunds. And you can see here then that those dates then 
get populated based on um, you know that specific month. Um, we talked a little bit about recreating an ACH submission file, um, going back to that and talking about how um, the ACH file generated files get changed from true to false. Um, this happens when the posting period has to be open for the month that they're wanting to create the file for. So those get switched then. Whoops. Show you what I'm talking about here. So here you can see if I go back and show the posting periods. You know, we have everything um, from July, August, and September. We have those set to true, and then everything else is obviously not current and closed. When I go to my ACH submission, then by default, I only see, um, you know, those from my current period forward, um, and then these are false. Okay. Make sense? All right. Okay, are there any questions when it comes to um, posting periods? Kind of went through that fast here, went keeping up my time. Okay, we're gonna switch gears then and finish up with talking about supplementals. Um, I know probably all of you that have been um, working with your districts and um, you know, migrating them and helping them if they've been you know, on the system for a little, a little while, um, supplementals can be a beast. Um, and who knew there were so many different ways to process supplementals, right? Um, everybody's, you know, negotiated agreement is so different. Um, some stretch them over, you know, X number of pays in the season, some pay them at the end of the season, some pay them, you know, the first pay of three months throughout the season. So, um, they really, you know, there's not a set one way. This is how um, those need to be or should be done because every district handles them so differently. Um, I think the main thing to keep in mind is, you know, for ease of paying them, um, how, how are they paying them? Are they, you know, stretching them over X number of pays? That's the simple, simple, easy um, way to to pay them, right? You set them up just like you would a normal um, contracted compensation. You know, you stretch them starting this pay, you know, for the next five, whatever. Um, that's the easy way to do it. Um, what's not so easy is when they have all those other, you know, options they're wanting to, you know, pay them sporadically throughout the season, throughout the year and so forth. So how can we set those up? And again, this is by no means, you know, this is just options. Um, so we might have to work with on a one-to-one -one basis if you have, you know, something that is different that we have, that we have, than we have come across before. But really, you know, how do I determine whether I should set the, the compensation up as a contracted or a non-contracted? If the system truly checks for contracted compensations, there's two things. Are they stretch paid? And do they have work days on the calendar that they're associated to? So if the answer is no, then to both of those, then that's when you wanna set, encourage your districts to set those um, supplementals up on a non-contracted compensation. It's going to be much easier um, to make that those situations work that way. Okay. Um, so, you know, if they're set up on a contracted compensation, you're familiar with those. They have work days. They're added. You know, probably their position status is set to active. Um, they're going to automatically be pulled into the payroll um, for X number of pays. Or maybe they're 
um, going to be paid for three pays, but not consecutively. So you could still set them up as a contracted compensation, but set the position status to inactive. And then at the appropriate pays for X number of pays, the district would then add those compensations to the payroll um, at the appropriate times. So just because they're not paid consecutively doesn't mean that they can't be set up as a contracted compensation. They just will have to add them into the payroll at the appropriate times, okay? So if you know they're not comfortable with adding um, the job calendar that has days on it, um, and or they're not gonna be stretch paid, then that's when we're gonna need to set up those non-contract compensation records, okay? Um, shoot, I lost my train of thought. There was something I was gonna say about contracted. And it left me, I'm sorry, it'll come back to me. Okay, so, um, oh, I know what it was. Some, I know some districts, um, because they um, do want to set them up as contracted compensations, um, but they weren't, they weren't um, used to having that, those um, job screens in Classic attached to a calendar with work days on it. And now in order for it to work correctly, they do. Um, if they want to use the contracted type. So what a lot of districts have done is they've actually created um, sort of a, a default set of calendars for um, maybe seasons. So they might have a set of calendars set up for fall, winter, and spring. And then they can actually attach all of those fall supplementals, winter supplementals, spring supplementals to that calendar. So then you can use the contracted compensation type and the system will handle everything correctly. Now they still may need to add um, some adjustments for work days um, if you know those calendars aren't giving them the you know correct or true um, amount for you know days and hours that they are um, needing to give them credit for. Um, and some day some you know districts um, they're perfectly fine so or some situations. So again, um, I know a lot of districts have moved to setting up those um, supplemental calendars so that they can use the contracted type, okay? Um, just a note, um, and this is obviously a very district um, you know, decision, but if you have a teacher in a district that's you know, attached to a job calendar with days on it and hours, um, then, they can actually use that same um, job calendar for the supplemental. Um, as long as there aren't any you know, extra hours or days that they need to be given credit for, which again, they can then use the adjustment um, to give them credit for, they're not gonna get credit for the same day twice. So you know, if a teacher is pointing to a teacher calendar and their supplemental is pointing to the teacher calendar, you know, the system is smart enough to know a day is a day. Um, they're not going to get two credit for the same day um, twice. So no worries when it comes to that. So again, as we touched upon, you know, when do I use non-contract um, that specific type? When positions aren't attached to job calendars with days on it. Um, so the system accepts, um, you know, the, they work a little differently um, and accepts those. So um, that's when you're going to want to set up those types of situations um, as the non-contracted type. Okay. Unfortunately, at this time, um, if there is um, a position that's created with the contract of non-contract and or um, contracted, and the wrong type was used, um, there's really not currently any way to fix that. You can't modify the, the contract type. Um, what, instead, what we suggest um, is they just archive that and then create you know, the um, correct contract or the correct compensation with the correct contract type. Um, we do have uh, a JIRA issue, and I included that here. 
um, to be able to modify um, and change this contract type if um, it has not been paid on. So, you know, look forward to that in the future, but at this time, they will just have to strictly archive those um, that have been created, you know, in error. Okay, so there's various ways to go about, you know, creating these um, contracted and or non-contract compensations. We did a whole session on new contract, um, you know, back at the beginning of school. So we're not really gonna touch upon that's kind of the more obvious, you know, way to create um, these record, the, the contracted compensation records. You cannot create non-contracted compensations using new contract. Um, so they would have to use what we're talking about, I'm gonna talk about next, the mass load option. Okay, so districts have to make a decision um, you know, in current, or I'm sorry, in classic, if they went to job screen, um, lots of districts just continued to pay on that same, um, you know, job screen over and over. So if it was, you know, a, a coach, they might just go in and update um, the contract amount. They might clear out then the amount paid, the number of pays paid, and just keep reusing um, that record. So you can, you can do the same thing um, in um, the redesign, and we're going to talk about ways to just reuse that um, and clear those figures out. Um, however, if they do want to create a new um, contracted or non-contract compensation, they can use the mass load option to do that. Um, we can't, um, legacy records are kind of a, a a thing of the past. Anything you see with the word legacy on it, hopefully by now you know that means classic. We came from classic and we're you know about to be all done with those records. So that's super exciting. Um, but you can use the mass load option to actually create um, you know a spreadsheet and then load those in using um, the mass load option. <clears throat> we do have um, you know a nice um, uh, explanation of uh, the ways to use mass load in the mass load um, chapter in the documentation. Um, I have included the link here. I do want to show you because I think I have it pulled up. Yep. Um, so this is, you know, if you click on that link, this is where it's going to take you. Um, I did want to point out, and I have this in the PowerPoint as well, um, to create or update um, a compensation. Um, this value here used to be the ID. So it was that long convoluted um, under the more option. It was the very first field that you could add to um, your grid. This now has been replaced by the code. So hopefully you remember, um, it's been a while ago now. Oops. If you go to um, the compensation record, we added this value here um, called code. So this is the unique um, identifier for this specific compensation. So if I create a new compensation, however it may be, I am not gonna be able to reuse this code. It's gonna have to be a, a unique um, value for this new compensation. And that's again, because unlike classic, we're not overriding the existing compensation, we're creating new ones, okay? So everything is identified by this code. So um, if you want to use, oops, sorry. If you wanna use um, mass load to update or to add, it all comes down to this code. If you're wanting to update, an existing compensation, you just want to reuse that um, for this purpose, then you're going to use the same code that we just looked at. So I would use this code here. If I would like to create a new compensation, that's where I have to actually, you know, enter that new um, unique code that's going to identify something that doesn't already exist on the system. And that's going to tell 
the software then to create a new a new compensation. Okay. So again, it, it's all coming down to this code value. Um, just kind of pointed out um, under the more option, you know, where that can be found. It's under the compensation um, carrot. So if you open that up, you can see the, the code and it's going to add that um, those codes then that column to your grid. And again, we talked about you want to use, you know, if you're just updating, you want to use the existing code from the current compensation. Or if you're creating a new, you want to enter a new um, compensation or a new code, sorry, to create that new compensation. Okay. All right. When it comes to um, creating, helping create those non contract compensations, we actually have a report under the report manager, um, and it's called the SSDT non contract compensation mass load extract. So um, you can use this one of two ways. You can use this to create your new, if you're wanting to create new non-contract compensations, or you can use this to update your existing. Um, so totally a district decision if they wanna reuse what's already there. Um, you can use this to remove old information, or if they're wanting to create um, you know, new non-contract compensations, they can use this extract to do that as well. Okay. I do have a copy of once you run that. So again, if you go into reports and then report manager, you can see then um, I'm going to go down to this SSDT non-contract compensation mass load extract. And when I run that, you can see this over here. Um, it extracts all of this, you know, information that's that's needed or could be needed um, to, um, you know, either clear out, reuse, create new non-contract compensations. Now, what I did find, and you've probably found some, noticed um, this as well, is that extract is very broad. So it's extracting you know, lots of records, and maybe um, some of those records aren't going to be used um, going forward. So if you go to that, remember all of those um, options under the report manager, those are what we call template reports. So they can be tweaked, updated, added, you know, modified in any way that you feel, you know, works best for the situation. So there might be, um, you know, ways that we can kind of improve this to filter out um, other information that we don't, you know, want to use going forward, or we don't need in our extract. Um, the last pay date um, can be found using the under the employee. So that might be something that would be helpful so that you can, um, you know, filter out or at least have that in your your spreadsheet, and then you can filter it out in Excel if you choose to do so, you know, to get those that are maybe more, um, more recent, been used more recently. Um, the other thing that would be helpful is the amount paid. So maybe, um, you know, that would be helpful in knowing, hey, they've, you know, they have an amount paid on their um, current record, so that kind of gives me some guidance to know this is a record that I might, you know, want to build and, and import and create um, going forward. And that is, I find it here. Oh no, sorry. I thought I had this added to my grid and I think it must have refreshed and not. Um, last paid compensation amounts amount paid. Here we go. So under compensations amount at the very top of your screen, if you add the amount paid, um, that, that might be helpful as well. So just a couple additional columns that might be helpful when you create your extract to filter out, you know, old records that, you know, you might not, or districts might not necessarily be needing um, to be creating new records for. 
Okay. All right. So once you have that, um, you know, extract, um, once you have that extracted and you have that file built, then there are a few things that you'll need to change um, if you're wanting to clear um, out. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the, cre the clear amount. Um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. I'm sorry. This is the, the values then that you'll want to make sure you add um, when you um, create your spreadsheet um, to upload and use mass load. So you need to have the pays paid, the amount docked, the amount paid, and the amount earned. <clears throat> and then the days worked will actually need to be added to the spreadsheet. And then you'll obviously enter zero in that value. So all of these then um, can be these various columns in your spreadsheet will actually then clear out um, all of those, you know, the, the values that are currently there. So when you have that extract um, completed, you'll change these columns to say, pays paid, amount docked, amount um, paid, amount earned, um, all things that we have documented again in that chapter. So this is exactly what um, the column headings need to be. And then you will put in, then change those um, to be a negative. So whatever the value currently is, that needs to be changed to a negative so that those two you know, offset each other and that amount becomes zero, okay? Um, once you have your spreadsheet then in place, um, you're going to save that as in CSV format. And then using um, mass load, you'll go to choose file, browse to find your file, and then make sure your importable entity is compensation journal. And that then will create all of those adjustments to clear out all of those fields, you know, in a couple clicks. Um, that saves a lot of time, you know, in going in and posting those individually. And you can see here then once that file is posted, then those values have been zeroed out. The district can enter their new information for those non-contract, um, for, you know, the new, the new contract, and then be, begin paying. And these will all be reflective then of the current um, compensation. Okay. Are there any questions on, um, you know, using that template? Again, you know, you can use um, the new contracts for your compensation, contracted compensation types. But unfortunately, you know, we can't use that for um, the non-contracted. So you would have to use um, some sort of extract file in order for you to, you know, create something to mass um, generate those. I did also wanna point out, we do have um, in the reports, report repository. So under help, this public shared reports library, um, there are options here to create, um, or there's templates available when you're creating new types of records. So we do have one for the contracted compensation and then the non-contracted compensation. So if you're wanting just to create something brand new, um, these templates would be super helpful. Um, you can use them then um, as a beginning, you know, to, to create those records and then load them um, instead of, you know, starting from scratch. Um, and entering those one by one. So again, I wanted to point out that those two templates are out under the uh, report repository. So if that's you know something that would be helpful to your district, um, you know just make sure that they know that those are available. Okay, and then lastly, um, I know with the classified, um, you know, compensations, um, STRS you know, they can't be as user-friendly as STRS is, and it does get very, 
confusing for districts. And, you know, I think us ERAS is sort of clamping down on um, ways that districts were reporting days and hours in the past. Um, and that really wasn't how they wanted that to be reported. Um, and it's just the transition to redesign. They're kind of finding that out and making districts sort of change their ways as how those how that information is getting reported. So just to clarify, you know, the STRS per pay report, um, how do we get this information? So we go to the pay history, you're entering a payroll, you know, in the actual report itself, you're entering a pay date, you're earning that, entering that um, period beginning and ending date. Um, remember, if a district is using the additions option, you'll have to have multiple lines um, when you're creating your file, um, you know, indicating that other period beginning and ending date for all of those um, additional options um, that the district has run their payroll for. Um, then they find SERS positions. Um, you, they, it looks at the days on the calendar, okay? And it also looks at the attendance and absence and entries that fall within that date range. So again, it's the start and the stop dates for that, you know, pay date that you're generating the report for. It also looks at the calendar start and stop dates. So super important because I think, you know, somehow start dates aren't getting entered or stop dates are mistakenly getting entered and then days are not getting calculated correctly. So make sure that you're looking at start and stop dates um, on those calendar as well. So it's using that information um, and then it's gonna compare it to the dates of the pay group and the payroll, okay? So if there's any adjustments, so it's gonna look at adjustments next, they have to fall within the period beginning and ending dates for, for that employee. So not the pay date, which again can be get can get confusing because I think Classic may have used pay dates more so than what Redesign does. Um, again, everything's date driven, so more more than likely it's between the period beginning and ending date for the payroll that you know was initial initialized or, or uh, posted. So again, those adjustments have to fall within the pay period. Okay, and we have a note about. Are they using the additions option? Make sure that you know they're adding that um, those start and stop dates to that specific time period that they're generating the report for. So if I go here, you know, just make sure that if they're using the additions option, that they're adding those lines here when they're generating their STRS per pay report. I also think it's important to note that down here, this is a great reference. You know, um, if you if districts don't have their checklist in front of them with dates on it, this is super helpful. Okay, I enter, you know, 715 in my as my pay date. I enter the start and stop date of you know 71 to 715. I'm good. However, this does not show you the additions selection, you know, the dates if they ran their um, and ran additions. So if you're even helping um, districts and they're like, hey, I'm missing, like, you know, my, sub, my supplementals aren't showing up at all. Um, chances are, you know, they may have used the additions option. And really the only way you're gonna see that is if you go to the details of the payroll and look down here at all these start and stop dates for your various pay groups. So if there's dates that are different, Obviously, we have to include those in our STRS per pay report in order for those to get picked up. And any, you know, attendance absence days, any adjustments, you know, all have to fall within these dates. Okay, so just something to keep in mind, because I think a lot of times the additions options, you know, get missed. Um, and um, if you're not seeing groups of people, more than likely that's where the problem um, Lies. Okay. All right. Let me make sure I, I think I, 
Yep. Covered all my tabs. Does anybody have any questions, comments on anything that we discussed as far as posting periods go or um, supplementals? I don't see anything in the chat. Hopefully we haven't put you to sleep. <laughs> um, and hopefully you've uh, picked up, you know, lots of valuable information, um, you know, with what Andrea covered and what I just covered. Um, I did want to, before we leave, point out that we do have um, a full couple months coming up. Um, our, you know, right up to calendar year end um, next Friday. Um, is the intermediate session for USAS. Um, and then we'll have our, um, you know, pretty much every week there's a session scheduled. Our uh, review of calendar year end is on November 10th. Keep in mind, this is on a Thursday and not a Friday. Um, we have a internal mandatory meeting that we have to be at on Friday. So this is you know, a change and it is on Thursday. So just make note of that. So you're not, you know, jumping on Friday and saying, where is everybody? Um, it is, it has to, it had to be moved to Thursday. Um, so yeah, so don't go, don't forget to go out to our, our training um, page and then, you know, get signed up for these wonderful sessions that we have planned all the way through um, calendar year end. Okay. One last call for any questions. All right, if not, I hope everybody has a wonderful Friday, um, a wonderful weekend, and I'm sure we'll talk to everybody real soon. Thank you.